Hello, everyone, and welcome to another GitDrop.com podcast. I'm Jonathan McCreary. With me is Andy McKenstry. And my goodness, what a pulsating couple of Grand Prix in Turkey, Andy. How's your heart rate a couple of hours after the oh, event's finished? Unbelievable. Unreal. Both GPs are class. Good double header. All around. Fantastic racing. And, oh, the level of that MXGP class. Not only the level, but the the entertainment in the, at the front of the class as well. It's just an all round package this year and we're, we're really being treated as fans. It was really, really great to watch. Fantastic. Especially the first GP Muru today, the MXGP of Av- Avion. Oh, everything that could have happened did happen. It crashes, it had passes. Oh, last lap was unreal as well. So good. Yeah, I think well, maybe all four Murus was pretty much the top five in the World Championship. We've all a chance at the title. Going for it for the both Grand Prix in Turkey and the track obviously was wasn't easy to pass on but it was very technical it was difficult to navigate the ruts there was hard packed slick coming out of it you had to be very precise but then all those guys had to try and make passes as well so although it wasn't maybe the, the best track for passing the racing actually was still quite good because even when they weren't passing it was so tense you were almost holding your breath waiting on who was going to make the first mistake or who was going to try to go for the first pass because you knew the pass was going to have to be pretty aggressive. For all four motors, there was there was so much tension in the race the whole time. Absolutely. It was really, really good. And, and I have to say, I know there's people are being very negative with the track, but personally, I thought it was quite good. And it was nice to see them not doing too much track prep as well because obviously the track was fast, but that's just the nature of the track. And if they had a start level loads of it, then it would have made it even faster. And I thought by the end of the day, it was quite sketchy. So good job in that department. It was good, uh, quite technical and got rough at the end and I quite enjoyed it. Obviously not everyone's cup of tea, but at least it wasn't just a speedway, easy track, you know, so that was quite good. And yeah, you had to be very precise and navigate uh, the lines uh, carefully because if, that's what it came down to. If you made a mistake, somebody was there to... Uh, to, to pass you really so great stuff and I have to say Antonio Crowley in that first moto on the last lap the racecraft that man has is really really good because not only did he pass Geyser but he also knew to run Geyser out wide because he knew or he knew that uh, if he left it to, if he didn't go straight on and t- took the corner like normal that Geyser would have got the drive so the racecraft he showed <laughs> yeah exactly but he needed to do that because he did, if he yeah. hadn't guys you would have had the momentum and got him so i think that shows how with all that ma- madness that was going on you know Caroli was still thinking with a clear head there so it just goes to show the racecraft that man has at 36 this month i think we'll start with Caroli um we need to say as well that this is a golden era of world championship motocross a lot of people go back to the 80s or want the 90s and want this and that but there's no doubt that this era has to go up there with this good or maybe even better than any other era obviously the 80s was very good Thorpe and Malherbe and Gabors and all those guys in the 90s was tough especially the mid 90s with Albertine Everts and then you had Tortelli and a few years ago as well was good but to have Geyser, Fevre, Caroli, Hurlings and Prado all world champions all of them except Prado multi-time world champions and all going at it and then you have Caroli who is the Valentino Rossi of the sport right now, putting in rides like he did today and even at the weekend before, he was exceptionally good. But the one thing about Caroli, these first couple of laps, even if he gets a good start, he's getting shuffled back. Geyser was able to pass, pass him early and then he's having to make the ground up again. Like Geyser revealed on the MXGP studio show that it was actually him that knocked the bales onto the track at the weekend. So... Geyser's obviously got a bit out of shape and it's Crowley that's ended up paying the price. And Crowley, I don't think, has had the luck this year. Certain moments just hasn't went his way, whereas Geyser's been the opposite moments that could have went really bad for him, haven't been too bad. And credit to him, he's been able to capitalise then in the next moto or the next round to set the record straight as, <clears throat> as he did in the second moto today. But Crowley, that the first weekend, he was actually strong. I don't think the two fifth places reflect just how well he was riding but as we mentioned everybody was so close together all the top contenders were so close together he had that crash with a hay bale when he was going for Prado and I think his speed was probably at least a podium that weekend today he was absolutely flying you could see whenever he was fourth 
the effort as he was coming over, whipping and scrubbing over them jumps. Every time he was looking to see where the gap was, he was putting everything into it. And at one stage, he was maybe losing half a second here, gaining half a second there. But everyone looked like they were on their limit. And then the last 10 minutes, he really just started reeling those guys in. And by the end, he was right on them. And as you say, his experience with himself, when Fevre went down, Crowley just went for the kill on Geyser. And Geyser mentioned after that he was pretty disappointed that he let let Crowley get him. But for Crowley to come from where he was at his age to catch that top three and almost actually get hurlings on the line, that was one of the best Grand Prix motos I've, I've seen him ride, especially under the context of the quality of competition and the age that he is, his, his willingness to take the risks and push that hard is unbelievable. Absolutely. It's certainly one of the best moto uh, rides of his career. Obviously, I don't think it's quite as good as Arco. You know, that must be three or four years ago now where he was just flying so much faster than anybody. You know, the way MXGP is these days, it's hard to be that much quicker now than everybody else because they're that much quicker. So, you know, it, it took him a wee bit longer to catch him this moto, but my goodness, it was some unbelievable ride. The effort he put in and with the heat as well and just really, really good. Um, unbelievable, really. And another lap, who knows what would have happened because it was that close at the finish line. But it's great to watch him and Prado go at it as well. The amount of battles they've had this year is just phenomenal. To touch on the level of MXGP, it's, first of all, it's great to see everybody stay injury, you know, the top five riders stay injury free. We had a bit of a scare today with Prado, but... Thankfully, he's fine after the the crash he had. But with this top five, it's just it's it's just unbelievable, really. And it's it's going to be sad when some of these riders retire and hang their boots up because even though the next generations obviously has a lot of talent, it'll be a long time I think before we see something like this. I mean, you've got Antonio Crowley nine times world champion. You've got Geyser and Hurlings on four. You've got Prado on two, and then you've got um, Fever as well. It's just phenomenal, really, and the level really is through the roof, and it makes it hard for those guys, those other guys, to try and even just break into the top ten at the minute. Yeah, we're, they're kind of the aliens, like it was in MotoGP a few years ago. You have the four aliens. I think now at MXGP, you have the five aliens. And then at times, Paul's Jonas in Turkey, we'll touch on him later. He had the speed to kind of go with those guys for a while on certain motos. He's right there. And then another weekend, as Glenn Coldenhoff has the capability of doing that, or maybe a Jeremy Sewer. But apart from that, it's very difficult for anyone else to get into it. And even those guys that have the ability to do it, to do it week in, week out, they haven't quite found that consistency yet of the top five who are just there every week, running at an elite level pace and fighting for wins. And us making the start so crucial. That second motto for Crowley, he didn't get a bad start, but guys are made the pass and he got into that top three straight away. Again, Caroli couldn't get through as well. And then he once he did get into fourth, he didn't have the speed to go with the top three, even though he was only about a second behind Geyser. So those early moments of the race are making it hard for Crowley. I remember Everts was a wee bit similar at the end of his career. Those first 10 minutes, it took him a while to find that rhythm. But once he found the rhythm, Everts obviously was quicker than everyone else, but Caroli at times even has been quicker than anyone else, and he's at least then that speed. But you can't let the rest of the guys get away. He's actually given himself a lot of hard work. When pace-wise, he doesn't really need to because he has the pace. He's just not clicking into that gear quick enough sometimes. Yeah, although the, the one thing about Crowley is he's been renowned for his really good starts. You know, before Prado and, and stuff moved up to MXGP, you know, Crowley was getting hole shots all the time, but now Prado seems to be the main man and Crowley's starts just aren't what they used to be. I'm not sure if that's on him or if everyone is up their game at the starts because, you know, all these riders know how important the starts are. So probably that's got something to do with it as well. But um, it would be nice to see him improve on his starts, you know, to be top three every race because I think if he can do that, it'll certainly make life a lot easier because we all know the intensity at the start of the moto. He's, he's 36 soon, but not only that, it's it's... It's always been one of Crowley's uh, weaknesses, let's say, is the intensity at the start of the moto. You, you know, he was he was renowned for letting other guys maybe just go into the sunset and then he would catch him in the long grass. But the way MXGP is now, you can't really give these guys um, the, that type of advantage. So 
the intensity at the and the opening laps is where he needs to improve. But you definitely can't fault the speed and his work ethic and how much he wants it. He, he really does want this tenth world title. So it's going to be fascinating. It's into the sand at the next round now uh, in Sardinia. It'll be definitely an interesting one. Yeah, and Caroli, despite riding really well for the last four motos, he's actually lost ground to Geyser, and probably principally because of those starts and maybe the first couple laps in the races. The rest of the time, he's been as quick as anyone. But he's almost 30, I think 29, nine points back, which just isn't ideal. Although for him, he had to have Riola coming up next in Italy in the sand. But for Crowley, he probably wanted to gain a few points and Geyser just kind of went the other road even though he's actually riding really well. So he's, I'm sure he's a wee bit frustrated with that. But as you say, you can't question the guy's fitness either. To be running that pace at the end of those motos in, uh, in high altitude is a testament to his work ethic and what he's doing off the bike and, and through the winter as well. So no lack of motivation for Crowley. But I think we'll have to go to, to Jeffrey Hurlings. He was the winner of both Grand Prix. Played it pretty smart, I thought, especially the, the first moto on the, on the Sunday. He could have... I think he said he had arm pump early. On that, on that track, you can't really make any mistakes and the front guys were getting away from him, but he didn't seem to panic. He paused Jonas actually catching him. He was flying. And then suddenly he got, started to find his groove in the last half of the race, made the moves to get the win past Prado, which not many people can do easily. And Hurlings doesn't usually find it easy either, but he was able to get the job done there. Again, second moto, second, but he had to come from away back. And then today... First moto, quite similar, although he sort of admitted he got a bit of a gift with when Fevre went down, but he was trying hard to make the pass. Prado obviously crashed out earlier as well, but they were all just kind of in that train. And everyone was on each other, and that probably made it harder for Hurlings to risk doing a wide line to set Fevre up because Geyser or Crowley could have got him when he's going wide, somebody up the inside. So he was kind of in a weird way in a tough spot running second. But he got the job done again, got first and the second in the first race. And in the second moto, he was honestly admitted that Tim Geyser straight up beat him. Geyser lost another five points to Hurlings, but as he did in the second moto in Turkey on the, the weekend, he came back and won after that sixth place. So Geyser is doing a fantastic job of limiting the damage. Just when you think the points are going to start to get really exciting and really close, Geyser produces a win. He done it today as well. And he actually looked, once he got into his flow, he just, something happened that halfway point, And he thought, I'm going past Hurlings. Made the move in Prado. was quite close, just like it was at the weekend. Got the lead. And then he just started clicking off those fast slap after fastest lap. It looks like he was just saying, try and stay with me, Jeffrey. And Hurlings couldn't, which does it takes quite a lot of people. There's not met too many people have not been able to... Uh, have been able to break Jeffrey Hurlings in that scenario. And yes, it was hard pack, and yes, it was getting slick, so that would be Geyser's forte. But even so, to, to break Hurlings like that, because Jeffrey knows he can't be given those points, that was a six-point swing, that second moto. And Hurlings had to concede, but credit to him, he was able to take the high road there and say it's not worth the risk. He's gained two more points. He's got his 93rd Grand Prix win, closed in Stefan Everts, equal in Tony Caroli's GP wins. And he's gaining momentum, but it's probably not the amount of points he really wanted to get. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, well done to Jeffrey Harlings. As we mentioned in our last pod, it's go time for Jeffrey now. You know, he needs to go for it. And he won both GPs in Turkey, so he can't do too much more, really. I know we want them to go 1-1-1-1 one, 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 one every week to try and get back in this championship uh battle to make it interesting but you know it's Sam XGP it's going to be very very tough to go 1-1-1-1 one, 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 one every week and every moto so for him to go 1-2 at both Grand Prix in Turkey you know he was sensible in that second moto and he knew that guys was quicker so just took the second and he had a few and he had a dodgy moment as well that he actually got away with for once not often that happens <laughs> so uh you know, as a as a neutral, it would have been nice to see him beat Geyser in the second moto because the, the championship points gap would have been less than 30 then. As it is right now, it's 34 points. But I think Raiola is going to be key in this championship chase. You would probably expect Jeffrey to go 1-1 one, one there. If Geyser goes 2-2, two, two, it's going to be very, very tough for Hurlings to get these points back because there's not that much sand after and, these, and there's quite a lot of you know, hard pack tracks like this coming up and they'll suit Geyser. 
obviously you, you can say you can't you can't say never say never, but Raiola is going to be key in my opinion. So it's going to be fascinating there and um to see what way the championships gap is after that one. But Tim Geiser, any fair play to him as well, not Sakamoto, in my opinion. That was one of his best rides of his career as well. Anytime you think somebody's going to get back in, he just he always has an answer at the minute. So it'll be interesting to see if he's got the answers in the sun next weekend as well. Yeah, and Herlick, did you say 35 points back? Not completely ideal, but he is chipping away. There are nine runs left, albeit well. With, I think we're expecting a new calendar to come out. So whether there could be more sand races for Herlings there remains to be seen. But at the minute, he's able to accept winning by, say, three or four points each weekend on Geyser because over the nine rounds, that should bring him pretty close coming into the, the last round of the championship. But he can't afford to give away too many points, as, as was said, in those sort of races coming down because... Once you're in 34, 25, the last few few rounds to go, you're going to have to rely on getting big points. So Hurling's can't, he still can't make any mistakes. And he's still got, even if it is just a two or three point gap to Geyser, he's going to have to keep that ticking over the next few rounds and make sure in the small battles in each individual moto, the Geyser doesn't beat him too many times, especially like that, that second moto there. Overall, Hurling's got the win. But if he had beat Geyser there, it would have been an eight point gain instead of just a two point gain. So that could start stacking up. So as you say, for at races like Rayola, he's going to have to go 1-1 and probably cross his fingers that Prado and Caroli or whoever else can get in between him and Geyser and the and the results for both motos, and especially in the sand. But Geyser's really up to the sand game, so who knows? Exactly, this is it. That's what Hurling's exactly needs to hope for. The only thing he has to do is focus on himself, go 1-1, as you would expect him to do at Rayola. You know, it's going to be rough and bumpy, that track. It's actually great to see that track on the GP calendar. I enjoy that watching it that or watching the international championship uh, preseason races every year there. And it's uh, Hurling, you know, is going to enjoy that track. So all he can do is go one one and pray that Geyser doesn't go two two. If Geyser comes out of there two two, he'll be a happy boy. But yep, guys like you know Caroli. Even somebody like Jonas is going to be faster. Prado's obviously going to be quick. And, you know, Fever won, Fever won at Lommel, didn't he? Or no, us. Can't one of the San GPs Fever won at. So, you know, it's he could even be capable of getting in between them. So it's going to be really interesting. Let's stick with Roman Fever. Another race, another mistake. Another day where you're going home if you're Roman Fever with regret. For me, he's starting to have too many of these now. And it's really starting to add up on the points. And the worst thing about it for if you're Roman Fever is he has the pace. He's there every single week. He's getting opportunities to win races. Now, obviously, he's, he had a lot, a lot of pressure in that first moto today. But again, he made the mistake on the last lap. And you'd probably look past that if it was the only kind of mistake he'd made all year. But he's been making a lot of these wee mistakes. And whenever you're in that position to get points back on Tim Geyser, you can't you can't go down like that and give Geyser points on a race that you should have gained on him. And the second moto, he was fourth, fifth, fifth, I think, in that one. So again, he lost more points and Geyser won that. So the championship's going away from Fever a wee bit. And it's just those wee mistakes that are adding up. He's got to be very frustrated because his actual pace of riding is very, very good. Oh, Roman Fever is so frustrating. I mean, he was so good in that first moto. And, you know, sometimes with Fever, you can see a mistake coming, but actually he rode such a good race. And it was getting to the point where you thought he has this in the bag because he looked pretty, he looked in control of things. Obviously, he was under quite a lot of pressure, but he didn't seem to get uh, intimidated by it. But obviously, with half a lap to go, he, he had dirt. So that was it. And he picked it up for fourth. But Oh, very, very frustrating. If the checkered flag had it came out a lap earlier, you know, it would have been all hunky dories. But sometimes it's just uh, one mistake does that. And yeah, as you say, he's been making too many of them this year. But this one is the most frustrating one because he had done all the hard, hard yeah. work and he hasn't quite got as close to winning a moto like that before and thrown it away. So really, really frustrating. And then he's also been sick. So I think in the in the second moto, he struggled a bit with his energy and stuff. And that's why I got tired and Crowley and Prado were able to pull away from him. So very, very frustrating. Considering the amount of mistakes he's made, 
only still to be second in the championship and 29 points down, he'll probably be, be the rider that's maybe got the most regrets this season because if he had kept it in the two wheels, you know, he he could be right there. He might even have the red plate, but it's all if, ifs and buts at the moment. And he just needs to cut these crashes and mistakes out. Crowley is that he near has to look in the rear view mirror at the minute. Crowley's just one point behind behind with Rayola coming up. And Jeffrey Hurling's only six points back. And actually, even Jorge Prado isn't too far behind that, even though he'd the the DNF. So that the second to fifth is really tight now. But Geyser's been that those two second motors are absolutely crucial for Tim Geyser if he hadn't produced, which is credit to him for having the ability and the mental strength to do that. He would have been right back in this mix where the top five would have been really close in points now. But he's had the, the ability to, to go win when he's had to win when his back's against the wall. And he's now got a bit of breathing space, even though Herlings has won the last two two GPs. Now, a guy I thought would have been actually Geyser's closest challenger in the next few rounds, aside from Jeffrey Herlings pretty much winning, running the table for the next few weeks, was Jorge Prado. And his speed and qualifying, both both rounds in Turkey, he just went out, blitzed a lap, and he was pretty much the fastest, except for Hurling's amazing lap today at the very, very end. But he rode really well in the, in the first round, first round of the, the Turkish Grand Prix at the weekend. Prado almost got the overall second on the third. Pretty much what he wanted to do, gained a couple of points on, on, on Geyser. I think he was happy enough with that because he was close anyway. He had it down to 13. Then he was leading Turkey, had the pressure of everyone else. But when you watch Prado ride, it's just it's poetry and, and motion. He's so smooth. He's so technical. And that sort of track with the ruts where you have to be really precise seemed to be suiting him. And as usually had the mirrors on and he was just cutting across anybody that tried to pass him. And then he made that mistake and it was very, very uncharacteristic. We're talking about Roman Fevre and you kind of expect him to make a mistake, even if he doesn't crash and maybe make a wee one here and a wee one there. But with Prado, he rides so perfect. Whenever you see him just land on the ground, you're, you kind of draw breath. You're a bit pretty shocked by it because he never looks out of out of place. He never looks like he's riding the edge. But it shows you the level of this, this championship that even a guy like Prado, he's still close to the edge, even whenever he looks buttery smooth. Yeah, well, this is it. We talked about Fever um, missing out today, but actually, in terms of the championship, Prado is the biggest loser. You know, he's dropped down to fifth in the championship now due yeah, to that him. first moto. Yeah, he tried, you know, fair play to him for riding on, but he just couldn't get back into the points. And at the moment, the way the championship is going, you just cannot afford it. The NF, uh, or well, a no score moto, Geyser's the only one, I think, out of the top five that hasn't had that yet. Obviously, in the second moto on Lockett. He had a, his crashes, and but he, he fought hard and battled off with the damage bike, and I think he got six championship points, and they're looking pretty crucial now. So it just goes to show you can't afford the DNF because Prado was sitting pretty, looking like Geyser's biggest threat, and now he's dropped the fifth. Obviously, as you mentioned, second to fifth is very close at the moment, but it's a, it's a missed opportunity for Prado because he could have um, been second and the one closest to Geyser. So he's got all that hard work to do again now. A bit unfortunate, but, you know, at least he's injury-free. Uh, when he went down, you were sort of fearing the worst because he, he was touching his shoulder and stuff. You thought it might have been broke, but fortunately he's okay. and He'll go to Riola now looking for redemption there in the sand, but it's going to be a fascinating one. Yeah, and Prado 40 points behind now. And usually he, with his good starts, you rarely see him out of the top of the race, especially now that he's healthy. Maybe a fourth at worst. But that sort of consistent podium level ride that was slowly edging him up to Tim Geyser when Geyser was having a sixth or seventh, that's not going to be good enough anymore. He's going to have to either rely on Geyser having a DNF to kind of even everything out here so that all the, the other four can get right on him because Prado's within reach of Fevre. But right now, <clears throat> he's not within reach of Tim Geyser. And I'm not sure Prado can go on a winning streak like uh, like Jeffrey Hurlings can, especially when he's actually racing Jeffrey Hurlings, who's still intent on this winning streak to try and gain his points down. So that's going to be the test for Prado. Instead of just being consistent, can he go out whole shot and lead wire to wire for motos in a row to get the Grand Prix wins under his belt to close the gap? Absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head with Prado. You know, he's very, very consistent. And but the problem is, due to his good starts and how fast he is, but the problem is being 40 points down, as you said, he needs to just go for broken, go for wins now. And 
the end of Moto still seemed to be a bit of a weak point for him. And, you know, if somebody like Jeffrey Harlings is 40 points down, you can never really rule Jeffrey Harlings out because he, I think he has that extra bit of raw speed that if he needs it, he, 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 if there's anyone capable of going 1-1 every week, I, you would have to say it's probably get a hurling. So yeah. it's it's going to be fascinating to see how Prado reacts to this because he knows in the back of his head now he needs to win in Italy if he's to get get himself back in this. So it will be fascinating to see how that goes. But the the two good or the one good thing about Prado is you know he's going to pro, and most likely he take two good hole shots, so he doesn't have to worry about positioning himself in the motos at least. Yeah, that's that's his saving grace at times for for Prado. My voice is going here as too as I shout at the screen <laughs> earlier. Not the first time XGP moto. <clears throat> I haven't really thought about the the podcast later. But yeah, Prado at least has that those starts, and it looks like he has his fitness. So that that is two positive things. He need, just needs to keep putting himself in position to to try and get these moto wins, and hope, as I say, that that Geyser makes a mistake. But at the minute, it looks like. Well, even if Geyser makes a mistake, he's able to rebound with and, and get these motor wins. The others still need to get that bit closer to put the real pressure on him. And at the minute, it looks like Harlings is the only one capable of, of doing that. But those are the five. Those are the, the, the big big guys in the World Championship, the, the aliens now, as, as we're going to call them. <laughs> yeah. But best of the rest, probably over the, the four motos, was Paul Jonas. And when I say best of the rest, the times he was on that pace... So don't let the the DNF and, and Turkey in that first moto kind of fool you. He was on that pace ahead of Caroli and he was absolutely got a third in the first moto of the of the whole two Grand Prix in Turkey, caught the lead group. So his pace was absolutely fantastic. And I think he was riding a bit injured and he was still fast today. Fifth and seventh, I think he got. And again, just slightly off the pace of those guys. It looked like he was trying to hang on to their pace at times. Kind of scraping his fingernails on the on the door frame, trying to not get cut off for those guys. Eventually, he dropped back, but I think given that crash was pretty spectacular, and I was thinking this looks like typical bad luck for Paul Jonas. Just when he's right back, showing his form and showing his talent, he's going to have another big crash that's going to put him out for a while. So I was really happy to see him ride off with with minor injuries and come back with with the speed he had in Turkey. So I'm very very impressed with Paul Jonas. And I feel like he's almost replaced Glenn Coldenhoff, although he literally has replaced Glenn, Glenn Coldenhoff in the standing construct. Gas, gas. T- but now he's kind of being that guy. He's the guy that can get amongst those alien guys most regularly at, at the minute. And it's, it's great for Paul, as we've said before, after those injuries he had last year. But he's doing this consistently now, and his speed is getting very close to those guys on a week to week basis. Obviously, Paul still has the, those kind of random mistakes. And it's a bit of bad luck too where it happened and the way he crashed. But he's getting closer and closer to those guys. And it looks to me like he believes he belongs up there. There isn't there really any self-doubt. When he's, he was holding Caroli off, fighting him tooth and nail at the start of that second moto as well. And ironically, he's seventh in the championship just ahead of Glenn Coldenhoff. We'll touch on Glenn later. It's been a tough two Grand Prix in Turkey for Glenn. Although I still think he's one of those riders like Jonas who can get amongst that top five. But right now, Jonas, seventh in the championship, just ahead of Glenn, who he replaced in that standing construct team. Jonas has got to be one of the big success stories for me of of, of this world championship, considering the injuries he's come back from. Yeah, first of all, geez, Louise, that crash. Uh, I think Paul's has a has a thing for hitting the advertising board. I'm pretty sure that happened to him somewhere before. But my goodness, he just got it. Just goes to show how quickly it can all go wrong. He just hit a bump and. It shows how fast these bikes are these days as well. He had no time to react. He, hit, he literally got one bump wrong and he was in over the over the advertising boards and with nowhere to go. Scary stuff like that. that's That's nightmare kind of crash, that. But I was fearing the worst. But thankfully, he was okay. And, you know, after the, the, no, the no, no, no point score, he was able to rebound it for the next round. And a, a, a three, a DNF, a five and a six, Really, really good stuff by Paul Jonas. And this is the rider. He's now starting to show the potential a lot of people thought he had. And it's, it's really nice to see him do this in the 450. As you said, the standing construct team provides a really good atmosphere. It gives the riders the tools to deliver. And Paul Jonas is the, the latest example of this. And it's, it's also nice to see a rider come from Latvia and perform this highly in MXGP as well. 
So fingers crossed he can keep it up and he'll be looking forward to this and the next round as well. Right, are you ready to give this guy a round of applause? Alberto Ferrado, what an absolutely phenomenal <laughs> race he rode today. Just got points outside the top 15 on Sunday. And then next thing, he's running pretty much the pace of Paul's Jonas, who we've just been saying is almost on that alien level, and at times is on that alien level. Ferrado, unbelievable. Two good starts. It also shows how much the start makes a difference in this class, because Ferrado obviously came in injured with the knee and knee, I think it was, and he slowly worked his way back. He showed flashes of promise, kind of 10 to 15 range. But in Turkey, he showed where his talent level can get him. And you just have to sit back and, and applaud that guy. That was unbelievable. And he backed it up in the second moto as well. So this wasn't any, this wasn't a fluke. This was a guy who moved up <clears throat> earlier than he had to. And he's shown what the talent he has. It's just about harnessing that now, obviously. But that's got to be a huge confidence booster for him. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, where did it come? Where did it come from? You know, as we know, he barely had a pre-season. He's getting the grips with the MXGP class. And while his speed's been okay lately... It sort of came from nowhere to get sixth overall. So unbelievable. I'm not sure what, what if he changed anything in the back or if it was a mentality thing between the both the GPs, but whatever it was, it's worked. So if he can keep going going in that direction, more of that would be great for for uh Albi Ferrato. Unbelievable stuff. And obviously he's a rider that I always thought we would see the best of him in the four fifty. He reminds me of sort of Jasakonis, a big lanky fella. That's you know, let's be honest, Ferrado done done really well to have the good career that he had on the two fifty, but you know, he was to the disadvantage there. So it's nice to see him in the four fifty. Obviously, with the lack of preseason he had, we weren't really expecting much this year and it's his rookie year. So for him to get a sixth overall already is, is pretty incredible when you think about it. So um hopefully he can continue like this and keep progressing and maybe turn himself into a consistent top ten guy. Yeah, and that's put him into the top 20 of the World Championship. That result almost single-handedly. He's up to 18th and he didn't get a point in the first four rounds of, of the championship. So it shows just how much of a jump he's made. It'll be interesting to see what he can do in the remaining rounds, especially if he gets a start. Ferrado never really got starts in MX2, obviously, with the uh, weight ratio <laughs> going on there. Hmm. And that's part of the reason he's, he's on the bigger bike. But if he's able to get those starts, we've seen a few guys, Henry Jacoby rode well as well. Kept, when he got a good start and he was able to stay there, Kevin Stribe has got a start on, on, the, on the Sunday. Rode fantastic to get a top ninth place in, in the second moto in Turkey. So we're saying these guys are capable of doing it, but there's just so many riders that if you start outside that top 10, top 15, you have no hope of getting into the top 10 unless you're one of the, the world championship contenders. We saw that a wee bit. We'll t- touch on Yamaha now. Jeremy Sear had a pretty violent, violent crash on, on the big sweeper rejoining the start straight. That put him back. He just about got it back into the into the top 10. And he didn't even get in the top 10, actually. So it shows whenever even those really good factory guys make that mistake and they're back battling outside the top 10, it's hard for them to come through. So it just underlines what a, what a tough class it was. Guys are actually almost made the exact same mistake as Sir, but he stayed on, which probably sums up the difference between whenever you're your luck's going your way whenever it isn't for Jeremy Sears at a tougher season. Glenn Kodenhoff, very tough, tough two day, two GPs for him. He just cannot get the ball rolling at, at the minute after the, the second place in Holland, two fourths in the Czech Republic. It looks like things was really starting to go his way and he looked like he was going to be the the next guy to get amongst that top five or things have fallen off badly for him. And again, I'm not sure it's, it's riding so much. He looks good whenever he's getting <clears throat> whenever he's getting away. Maybe just not a tick off those elite guys. They were able to move around him, but he's not too far away. But as soon as you get a bad start or a crash or a problem, come through this field's proven very, very tough. And Ben Watson, that was a nightmare on, on the Saturday. Just about got points. Didn't seem to gel with the track. It was looking a bit like me, like it was Russia all over again. And then bang, he got the start in the first moto for Turkey. And I was actually a bit nervous because I thought if he's not on the pace last weekend and again he didn't have a good qualifying today, this could ruin his confidence if, if people start flying past him. But credit to him, he was able to get on the pace and score score a good result and then no points again the, the second moto. So that factory Yamaha team, 
very tough weekend. They've got to be scratching their heads looking for ways to, to rebound in 10 days' time. Yeah, very, very difficult for Yamaha. It's obviously been confirmed now that Jeremy Sear has Epstein Barfar. So it's obviously, it's, it's it was obvious something was wrong because that's not the Jeremy Sear that we know and got accustomed to. So it's going to be a battle for him to get back to 100% fitness, but hopefully he can get there as soon as possible, really, because I feel like he's the one rider that can run with the aliens, as you like to call them. Um, and yeah, Glenn Kodenhoff, I feel like his riding isn't the issue. It's just getting away and a bit too, a few too many crashes at, uh, in Turkey just proved to be a difficult weekend for him. So, But uh, it's the sand coming up next for him, so he'll be looking to rebound there. And Ben Watson's an interesting one. If you had to say who's had the best season between Watson and Olsen, the two rookies, you would right away say Watson because his highs have been a lot higher than Olsen, but Watson's lows have also been a lot lower. You know, this was Russia all over again for him and on these type of tracks. Watson can ride sand now. Forget about riding sand during the week. Go and ride these sand or these type of tracks during the week and get better at them because if you can master these type of tracks, you know, it'll make you a far more complete rider. But it's it's pretty clear that the slick car pack conditions are the areas he needs to work on. And it's quite hard to believe, actually. Um, Watson's 10th in the championship standing. And Olsen, who's went under the radar quite a lot, is actually only four points off him. So that's a wee uh, championship battle to keep an eye on in terms of rookie of the year. Yeah, that's all quite close there. And I think if Watson or Olsen get 10th in the championship for the rookie season... They'll be happy with that, but you have to think that both have kind of got their eye on each other, some sort of gauge. And as you say, Olsen has definitely been under the radar, radar until actually today where he actually put in two pretty decent results. But even then, it's not he aren't woed by his speed, although we've talked about the depth. So he, he's obviously going fast, but there hasn't been many woe moments for Olsen. And I was expecting a couple more. I thought his size would really have suited the 450. But as you say, Watson has had those woe moments, but then he's had those do moments in, <laughs> in Russia and Turkey. And it's actually evened out. But for me, Watson has showed the, the biggest promise, maybe, or the biggest potential going forward if he can iron out these choppy, slick, hard pack circuits. But Olsen, you never know. I still think he has potential on a, on a 450. His, his build and his height kind of you would think would play into this. He was a very good MX2 rider, and I think I expected a bit more from him. Lapino's had a fantastic year. He's ninth in the championship, but I would have kind of thought maybe if you swap Lapino and Olsen about, Olsen and kind of that 78-9 spot, I thought he could have been capable of. He's obviously could still get there. But 11th in the championship, not too bad, but I feel like kind of summarised the season. It's not too bad, and I was expecting a few more highs from him. Yeah, I have to agree. I was actually really looking forward to seeing Olsen in the 450, and in pre-season, he was riding really, really well. But I'm not sure if it's a mentality thing. You know, sometimes these MXGP riders, or these riders coming from MX2, moving up into MXGP, you know, it's important just to focus on yourself. It's very easy to start looking at other riders and being like, wow, I'm with the big boys now, but you can't think like that. And I'm not sure it's, if it's a mentality thing with Olsen or not, but history does suggest he does get better after a year or two years in a class. So uh, it would be stupid to um, yeah. rule him out for having a good future because I still do think he's got a lot of potential and probably just needs to get used to surroundings and get used to riding the MXGP class. Um, but yeah, I did expect a bit better this year, but he's still got time to turn it around. and. As you said, Watson has actually impressed me a little bit. I wasn't sure what to expect from Watson on the 450. Um, but he's actually had, as we touched on, he's had some very, very good moments so far. So I think he can be happy with his rookie season. He just needs to focus on that this these type of tracks that he seems to struggle at. And if he can do that, who knows what the future holds. But I would like to just give a shout out to Alessandro Lupino, actually, I thought. He had a really good double header in Turkey to go 13, 6, 9, 8 in the motos. You know, it's not easy to be that consistent in MXGP. And on the Mercati KTM, he hasn't got a factory bike either. So he's having a great season. And ninth in the championship, really, really good for him. On the Saturday, that first moto, or the Sunday, that's the first moto he came from way back to get to that 13th. So I thought that was really impressive as well. 
passing good quality riders, and he underlined that by, by his other results whenever he did did get better starts. So this Sunday in particular, he was absolutely flying. And Lupino on these tracks, he's always fast in these tracks, but I feel this year he's definitely upped his level, even on the hard pack. And the sand, he's, he's a bit better as well, but obviously these sort of tracks were slick. There was kind of aw- awkward ruts with chop in it. Lupino's very, very, very good at on these tracks, and he proved it again. He's having an absolutely fantastic season to be ninth in the championship ahead of factory riders. You have to take your hat off to him. Absolutely, and it's, it's good to see. And uh, Italy are looking pretty strong for the motocross the nations with uh, Caroli, Lapino, and Guardanini. Not a confirmed yet, but it's expected they'll be the three riders. So obviously not quite as strong as the Netherlands, but they'll be the two favourites heading into Mantova. So it should be a good one for Team Italy. And just quickly before we move to MX2, Calvin Villander and Brian Bogus are in that battle for 10th as well. They're just 10th. Temp- Calvin's 10 points behind Olsen, who's four points behind Watson, and Booker's is five points behind Vlandern, if you can follow all that. But what it means is they're all very close. And Vlandern, not the day he would have wanted today, good and bad Muru on Sunday. And Booker's was generally consistent all, all week. I feel like his performances are definitely, definitely coming higher. So those two, Vlandern, I think he his level is higher than it was in in Turkey for the majority of the day. Sometimes things just don't go your way, especially with bad starts on that track. But that, that battle, like we've talked about before, the, the depths of this championship, those are four really, really good riders. And they're battling for 10th in this championship. Um, the Lanterns had some outstanding motos. Ben Watson as well. Brian Bogers in the sand has been fantastic. And Olsen, as we mentioned, has been relatively consistent everywhere. So the, there's battles all, all over this championship. We mentioned Jacoby. He gets a good start. He can go to top 10, top 8. He had a few standout motors as well. But like Jeremy Van Horbeck, just ahead of Jacoby in the championship, 14th. He's kind of went off the boil a wee bit. Not his day, not his week in, in Turkey, especially today. Only only the one point. I don't know whether this is a Van Horbeck thing, bad luck thing, or if it's just teething problems with this first year bike. I'm not sure if you have any insight into that. Uh, I would say if I was taking a guess at it, I would say altitude issues probably because, you know, Beta don't have this experience like these other teams. So I would say probably that could have been their issue in Turkey. So hopefully they've got the right data from this and in the future at these type of tracks and having the high altitude, they'll be more prepared for it, hopefully. Um, but yeah, as you said, very, very deep. And yeah, Henry Jacobi had two good rounds in Turkey, actually. He, he, impre- he impressed me, so he did. Uh, especially getting a seventh in a moto and, and that stack class is very, very good. Flandering just needs to get his start sorted out because his speed's absolutely fine to be running, battling for 10th every week at least. But the st- you need to get away in that class and the starts in Turkey just weren't good enough. And that's what happens when you get a bad start. Bodgers, he actually missed the first round. So for him to get himself into that position already is quite good. I feel like he's underrated, but he's, he's good and at that type of, Turkey track has maybe been his weak link in the in the past. Yeah. So for him to to get a tenth and you know battling for top ten round hours, he got 11, 12, 17 and ten in the four moto. So that's that's pretty good considering the top five are mental. So and we didn't have any of the the British Championship guys, Adam Sterry and Sean Simpson, and also Conrad Muse missing in the MX2 class because of the the quarantine rules. It would have meant they would have missed the final round of the British Championship. So I'm sure they were all pretty frustrated to miss two Grand Prix rounds, although they all love the sand. So they'll be back hopefully for Raiola all being well in 10 days' time. Now we'll move on to MX2. This was kind of a tale of two separate races in the in the first kind of section. You had Tom Vial and Maxime Renault. They were on a on their own level, really. And I think as much as you can be impressed with Tom Vial, you kind of expected that because he's now had that month off, he's fit, he's firing again, and I think everyone expected him to be running up front. But for me, who impressed was Renault, because he didn't have to beat Vial, but he took it to Vial. And, and both Grand Prix, really, he set the pace, he laid down the challenge to Vial, and he showed that he has, looks like he's the only one at the minute, at least on that track, who has the speed to run with Vial, who was dominant last year. Yago Gertz, I don't know what has happened to him. He had arm pump surgery three weeks ago. 
he was off the pace, clearly couldn't get comfortable with the track. His qualifying wasn't great. His starts weren't amazing. Nothing went right. And he would have been the guy you would have thought would have been on the pace with, with Renault and, and especially Vial after last season. But Maxime Renault, it just shows you with confidence whenever you believe you're the man, your level rises. And he's the guy on the level with Tom Vial now. And again, another French one too. That country produces some amazing riders. And they were they were in a class of their own this this weekend, or both Grand Prix over the over the week. Yeah, I have to say, towards the end of last year, I did say, even though oh. Gertz and Vial are the title favourites, that here we go. Renault... <laughs> what? Here we go. Here, what? Here we go. Andy's knowledge coming in. <laughs> no, but I did say this guy. <laughs> do, not underestimate, <laughs> do not underestimate Maxime Renault. If there's anybody that can oust Vial and Gertz the title, he could be the guy with the full factory bike. And he's showing just how good he is. And Renault is a really good example for some young riders to use. It's 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 easy to forget, but this guy was on the sofa for two years injured, and he came back and raced the MX250 Championship. His first year back, he was good, but he didn't set the world on fire. And every year he's been getting better and better, and he's just a complete package now. Forty six or forty nine points championship gap. It's hard to look past him for this championship now, if unless he does something stupid or gets injured. But the way he's riding, really really impressive. And for me, it's, it's his mentality as well. It looked like a few rounds ago, especially from the, from the British Grand Prix. I actually spoke to him and you could sense the, uh, the calmness even in, in the interview that he felt that he was a world championship contender and he was ready to take that pressure. And each moto, he would assess the situation and make the best of whatever situation he was in. And recently, especially from, from Latvia, that, that double mode of win, that seems to have taken him to another level mentally where he really believes he's the guy to beat. And I think part of him going for Vial was to show Vial and everyone else that he's on that level now that Vial was on last year. And it's hard to doubt it. He doesn't seem to have a weakness. His bad motors aren't that bad. He's not unfurling himself in the kind of panic situation if he does have a bad motor or a crash. He's able to maintain a relatively okay result. And I actually mentioned it felt like he was just training, going off on a practice moto in the first moto today where he, he dominated. That was quite interesting, the psychology where Vial said he was tired and he saved himself. And then whenever Vial beat Renault in the second moto, Renault said a lens popped his, or a stone popped his lens out. So he slowed down for that. So both of them are giving themselves a bit of a kind of out for, for, for not winning. But I think that shows just how much Renault wants to win and wants to prove he's on the level of, of Tom Vial this year. It looks like he's going to be the dominator in the championship unless something goes massively wrong now. But that kind of vial Renault battle could be one to keep an eye on as well because Renault looks like he's on that level now. And, and as you said, fair play to him. He's chipped away at it. Each year he's gotten better and he definitely was showing pace at, on certain rounds last year and he was getting closer and closer to Vial and Gertz. But now it looks like he's there and it, it could be some good racing if, if Renault chooses to try and run that pace VL. Looks like he's going to have week in, week out now at the end of the season. Yeah, I think the one thing that uh, separates Renault from the rest this year is I think if he does get a bad start, you know, he's able to come through the pack and MX2 is deep this year. So it means if other riders are getting the bad starts, they're not able to do the same and they're maybe getting stuck in 7th, 8th or ninth. So that's where I've been most impressed with Renault. If he gets a bad start, he stays level-headed, he doesn't panic, and he believes that he's quicker than the other riders, and that goes a very long way, and I think that shows with his riding. But it's good to see Tom Vial get himself sorted out after the, the summer break as well. I think it will be it should be exciting battles between those two for the rest of the season. Vial obviously um, is, uh, is back riding the level with Noah, but I actually was impressed with him in the first moto because... He just accepted that Renault was faster. And, you know, for Vial, he knows the championship's gone. So what he's going to focus on this now, between now and the end of the season, is getting the GP wins racked up. So it was quite smart for him just to chill out in the first moto, just cruise around for a second, save energy. And it meant when he needed it in the second one to secure the win, he was able to do that. And for Vial, that's what it's all about now, really. Just rack up these GP points and build confidence heading into 2022. And... On Yago Gertz, obviously he done the right thing long term to get the the arm the arm pump surgery the sh- on his shoulder, but uh, it's it's you know when you can't train, Gertz is the kind of guy that needs to be training, have his routines. 
you know, it showed at the weekend that he hasn't had that during the, uh, the summer break. And actually, I thought under the circumstances, he'd done quite well. Sixth under the circumstances is OK. And he had fifth in the bag uh, at the second of the double headers until that crash. And then it demoted him to eighth overall. So really, that crash killed him big time. But in terms of the championship now, 71 points. He may as well just go out and enjoy the GPs now and have that mentality because it's going to be very, very difficult to come back in this championship fight now. Yeah, I think he, he needs a miracle at this point, or at least just to hit his top form and start reeling off wins. But with the speed Renault and, and Vial are doing, looks like they have up, up the level to me. I saw Benesson get away third in, in that second moto today, and he's been able to win races in the past, and he couldn't hang with them. So I think that's showing that they're maybe up on the level to a new height that, that it hasn't been all season. But I want to talk about that kind of third through through tenth place. On both Grand Prix, that was pretty frenetic. You have the young guys, Beniston, Guadagnini, who <clears throat> rode really well, both both GPs actually, under the, the kind of championship pressure that he'll also be feeling to kind of stay relatively close, 312 points behind, or points to Maxim Renault's 361, so just under, under the 50 points there. But he was battling third, fifth, sixth. They're just so similar. Rene Hoffer, really good as well. He was getting the good starts, actually led. He got arm pump in the first moto of the first Grand Prix. Kaido Wolf, I thought he was really good in the hard pack. And then they're taking on the older guys, like Jed Beaton, fourth overall today, third, I think, on the podium at the, in the first Grand Prix. Ruben Fernandez, he pretty much tried to clean Gertz out off the, across the face of a jump at the weekend. And then he produced a couple of class passes as well, although slightly less dangerous. There today on <laughs> Basrami, at one point he crashed, got up, and then two people pretty much went round him either side. He didn't know where to look. His head was in a washing machine. He didn't know what had happened to him <laughs> until he got spun out of there. And he ended up dropping out of the top 10. Jed Beaton, he crashed, although it wasn't his fault. He crashed into the back of a mistake from Guadagnini. Uh, he had some problem as well. He dropped out of the top 10 because they were all so close together. Once they got up and tried to refine their rhythm, because there was maybe a second over the other guys before the crash, it was just this buzz of intensity and riders going everywhere that, that looked like they just got rattled. And those young guys, they have no fear. and They don't care if those guys have more experience. They're just going to go for the passes. We even saw Hoffer on Guadagnini right on the last lap going at it in the, in the final moto. Beniston and De Wolf were going at it along with Hoffer. It was fantastic racing. Really, really enjoyed that MX2 class, even though the front two were, were kind of in a class of their own, but the battle behind them was brilliant. Absolutely. From third to tenth, it was just chaos, bonkers, riders going everywhere, just fighting the whole race and fighting for the position, which you love to see. But as they get a wee bit more experience, it might calm down a wee bit. No, so no, no, not, no, don't want that. Not be riding like that every weekend of their whole career. They'll not last too long, some of them. But I uh, have to say, sometimes you forget that Guarnini is a rookie in this championship. Yeah, you do. Obviously, you yeah. really do. Really, really impressive. Second in the championship. And it seems to be every condition he's, he's up there. And it's really, really impressive. And another one that we seem to forget about is Kaido Wolf. I mean, this kid's 16. He's Obviously, he's a rookie and Guardanini's a rookie, but we forget that Kaido Wolf was racing in an 85 three years ago. For So for the progress and the potential that this head has is really, really good. And he's starting to ride with his heart on his sleeve a little bit more, I feel like. He's, you can see him really pushing now, and he's, he really wants to take it to the next level. So it's, it's fun watching him race and really, really good. And one rider who actually impressed me in Turkey was Wilson Todd as well. Oh, he was he fantastic, wasn't overall. he? Overall, really, really good. Yeah, very, very impressive. And to do it in four motos and to be that consistent, really, really good. Dixon might have, finally, after a few tough years, have a rider that can battle for some top five positions again. Yeah, that guy really impressed me, especially first moto. He was actually catching Gertz. And he had his, this was today. And he had his best best moto of his of his GP career, seventh overall, backed it up with the top ten again in race two. And you're talking about the madness there of the youth, but Wilson Todd seems pretty calm and amongst the madness. And he's quite <laughs> analytical in, in what he's doing. He seems to just be able to pick up the pieces of everyone else carnage. And he's up to twelfth in the in the championship now. And obviously he's only one day to learn all these tracks. He didn't get too many rounds last year with the injury. So for me, that's that's even more impressive. 
he's just behind Langenfelter, Bersami, Vial, De Wolf. The, the names are unbelievable. And for him to be 12th there with a lack of Grand Prix experience, I wouldn't say a lack of talent because I think he's shown his ability right now. But for Steve Dixon, this is a guy that, that could do big things for him, maybe even the end of this season, but certainly next season once he's an extra year's experience under his belt. Very, very, very impressive for Wilson Todd. Yeah, he might not have the Grand Prix experience, but actually he's one of the older riders in that class. So he's maybe more experienced worldwide than those guys and it maybe helps him stay level-headed and smooth and calm while some of those other guys are just balls out every lap. So that <laughs> might be a reason, but very, very impressive. You know, he has obviously rode AMA nationals and stuff in the past, but MX2 and these rougher, more technical tracks takes a bit of getting used to, but he seems to really getting to grips with the MX2 GPs now and it's, it's good to see an Aussie another Aussie perform well Yeah and we just heard they aren't actually going to the Nations this year with, with the COVID situation which is pretty much a shame because even without the Lawrence brothers they have some good riders over there I'm sure they could have put on a 450 even maybe Jed or Wilson Todd in the 450 those two MX2 riders plus a leading Aussie from there would have been a, a, a good motocross of nations, same to we, but like France, although not quite to the same level really, but the Aussies produce produce a lot of good riders at the minute. And the thing I like about them is they're able to adapt. You see with the Lawrence brothers go to America, obviously America is a lot, a lot more similar to Australia, so the adaption isn't as big there, but they're still able to do it. And these guys come into the Grand Prix being based in Europe or Belgium or Holland or, or the UK or wherever, whatever team they end up on. They're able to just focus and do their job and not complain and not get overawed by anything, accept the situation, deal with it, and, and let their riding be the talking. And you, ha- you have to respect the, the dedication they have and the mental ability they have to just get on with the job and, and start producing and showing their talent. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's always been the case, actually, but certainly with this latest generation of Aussies, yeah. it's impressive that the way they're able to adapt. You know, in the past, maybe some of them threw their dummies out and not not stayed too long and just went home or went to America or whatever. But these this latest generation of Aussies certainly seem very determined to make it, whether it's in America or GPs, which is which is good because they in the past they've grew up, you know, looking to America and that's been in the mindset they want to make it in America. And then maybe for that reason, they look down in GPs. But I feel like that's not the case anymore, which is good. It can only benefit them racing on the world stage as well so yeah it's good to see yeah and on that note I think that is us that's everything I, I had it in my head to talk about and um, my head's still a bit buzzing with, with all the action this this <laughs> weekend on today so I might have forgot a couple of things and they let me know if there's anything you else want to talk about uh, but... one writer Andrea Adamo he's impressing me yeah. every it feels like every week he's 10 to 15 now I might have not he might not have the balls out aggression to be, you know, to get in that top 10 all the time, but actually to be 10 to 15 every single race and every single GP is quite difficult. So if he can just step it up a notch, he can hopefully improve more, but the job he's doing so far is pretty good, I would say. And, uh, I wasn't expecting too much from him, to be honest, after missing a whole year of racing. So I feel like he's riding well this year. Yeah, good shot. He is riding very well. 15th in the championship. I think he has to be happy with that. And as you say, consistent over every condition, over every country. It doesn't matter where he goes. He's been, been very competitive. But I think we need a break now from that. There's 10 days to the next Grand Prix. Two in about five days is probably a bit too much. Oh, actually, I want to mention, <laughs> I mention, I want to mention the WMX. That oh, yeah. was unbelievable between... Duncan and Fontanese, those last laps were just all out. Duncan's like a wee Ricky Carmichael, determined angry. Personally, just won't give in whatsoever. And Fontanese did fantastic to hold her off. Those two are absolutely flying. That was that was brilliant racing. Yeah, just to, actually, just for a play at WMX, it's legit really good this year, you know? Like, the top 10s all going fast, and Duncan and Fontanese are just on another level. But it's good to see WMX have depth. You know, all, obviously in the past, the front riders have always been quick, but the top 10 this year, like I said, are all really good. Some promising young talents in the class, and they should only get better. But, wow, Duncan and Fontanese, Duncan is just really, really ruthless. And while Fontanese, I do feel like, is on her pace, always passes early. So it means Duncan's 
able to watch her and then maybe do other things. Fontenay is he doesn't know what Duncan's doing. And then before you know it, there's a lap, last lap showdown, but it was superb racing. Really, really enjoyed it. And hopefully that, that's a championship that can go right down to the wire as well. I feel like Fontenay has Duncan's pace, but Duncan has just that bit more ruthless maybe when it comes down to it. You know, if there's a last lap overtakes, she'll certainly stick it in, that's for sure. <laughs> It was fantastic, and as you said, Duncan, she's not scared to, to ride the edge and do what it takes to win. So, Fontenay, I don't know if you look around and see Duncan really angrily revving the throttle, going as hard as she can go, whipping it sideways on the last lap is what you want to see or not. But Fontenay's done well holding it in there and not uh, not cutting her any slack to get those two race wins. So, great, great racing between those two. But that's it. I think I'm away for a lie down, Andy. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'll speak to you all later. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, guys.